Well, hey, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the fifth message in the series that we've called Following Jesus Together, our tagline at Gateway Church. So we've been looking at the Apostle Paul and his friends, and they're traveling all over the known world on their first missionary journey to share the good news of Jesus with people who don't yet know him. In the first week, we talked a bit about the city of Tarsus, because that's where Paul grew up, and we had a message called Heed God's Call, where we looked at how Paul was born, and then he uh, grew up in Jerusalem, and how um, we talked a little bit about how he got called into ministry, and uh, we see this in his hometown of Tarsus, and they, um, Paul actually went back to Tarsus, and he, um, he was uh, kind of called by his friend Barnabas, who grabbed him, and they launched out in their first missionary journey, and that was our first week. The second week, we went to a place called Perga, and we had a message that Wes gave us called, Don't Give Up. And uh, this is on the southern side of Turkey. You can see how God worked through the ups and downs of this guy by the name of John Mark, who deserted Paul and Barnabas when they got to Perga, as you can see up on the map there. The third week then, as we're following along in this first missionary journey, we went to Pisidian Antioch, and we saw how Paul and Barnabas modeled God's command to preach the gospel. And, uh, and so uh, you can check out where Pisidian Antioch is up on the map on the north there uh, with my arrows. The fourth week, last Sunday, we followed Paul and Barnabas on the last leg of their missionary journey, first one, uh, into Galatia with the cities of Iconium and Lystra and Derbe, and we explored the need for endurance in ministry, the message called Endure Many Hardships. And Galatia, as you'll see up there, um, the green area up there is a large province in the Roman Empire, and you see the three cities of <coughs> Galatia that Paul and Barnabas visited. Now, this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to skip ahead now significantly in the story, and we're going to look at Paul's second missionary journey. And let me just give you an idea of how they kind of got there. Um, on his second missionary journey, Paul has a falling out with his friend Barnabas. They can't agree on whether to take John Mark with them this time, and so Barnabas takes John Mark, and they go back to Cyprus, and Paul grabs his friend Silas, and they then begin in Syrian Antioch again, as always. <clears throat> but on foot now this time, instead of taking the sea, they take an ancient trade route that leads to those same churches that he and Barnabas planted on their first missionary journey. Now they're back in the region of Galatia that you can see there. They travel through his hometown of Tarsus, and then they arrive at Derby, and then Lystra. In Lystra, he picks up a young man named Timothy, who joins him in his entourage. And then they go from there to Iconium, back to uh, Pisidian Antioch. The book of Acts says on this second missionary journey that at Pisidian Antioch, they tried to go westward into the province of Asia, probably to visit the cities of Colossae and Herapolis and Laodicea, and maybe even eventually at the Aegean to get to Ephesus. But it says in the Bible that the Holy Spirit wouldn't let Paul and Silas go westward. And so what they did was they went north, and they tried to go north into the province of Bithynia, as you can see up there, but the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them go there either. And so they can't go north, they can't go west on this second missionary journey. Where do they go? They head northwest to the ancient city of Troy. Maybe you've read the story or you've watched the movie. Um, it's now called Troas. In Troas, it appears then that there's this beloved physician by the name of Luke who becomes Paul's biographer he joins their entourage as well. And we know this because the language goes from third person where it's like they did this and that. All of a sudden it becomes first person. We did this and that from this point onward. And it's here in Troash where God gives a vision to Paul to cross the Aegean Sea and for the first time to bring the gospel to Europe. And that's into the area, as you can see, of Macedonia up there on the left. And... Um, <clears throat> They're hitting up cities like Philippi, Thessalonia, and Berea. Maybe you've heard of those. Now, in Berea, Paul and Timothy, sorry, Silas and Timothy stay behind in Berea, and Paul continues on south into the Roman province of Achaia, where they minister in places like Athens and Corinth for a series of months and even a couple of years. Finally, on the way back, we see where Paul intended to go, back when he was in Pisidian Antioch earlier, when the Holy Spirit stopped him from going westward into the province of Asia. Paul travels on boat 
from southern Greece with a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. These are tent makers and leather workers like Paul himself. And the three of them land in the great city of Ephesus. And here's the scene of our message today titled, Ephesus, Defend the Truth. And um, this place of Ephesus, Paul stays here in Ephesus on his missionary journeys more than any other place. But if you have a Bible with you this morning, uh, please open it with me to Acts chapter 18. We're going to read verses 18 to 23. And if you need a Bible, grab one from a member of our connecting team. They'd love to give you a Bible. You'll find the reading on page 1,570 in the Blue Bibles that we provide. And these verses <clears throat> describe the second, the end of Paul's second missionary journey and the beginning of Paul's third missionary journey. And I'll give you a moment to find the reference. Oh, it should say Acts 18. Sorry. That's not even right up there. Yeah. Oh, it's second service. I'm finally realizing that. Yeah. Forget about what it says up there. Acts 18. We'll change that for the third service. Uh, Acts 18, verses 18 to 23. All right. Anyhow, you're in the right area. Okay, here's what it says. So here's Paul wrapping up his second missionary journey, just beginning his third missionary journey, and it goes like this. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Chantria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He, went, he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it's God's will. He set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up to Jerusalem and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Okay, we're going to stop there. Keep your finger in the text. There's a lot of, you know, geographical places listed there. We'll try to unpack that. So Paul stays here at the end of his second missionary journey, a very short time in Ephesus, just a layover. Just enough for time for him to stop off at the synagogue and speak. And he delivers probably a very similar message to the one that he's been delivering ever since Pisidian in Antioch in Acts chapter 14, that Jesus is Lord and that he's the fulfillment of the promises to Israel that he died for our sins and that he rose again. But they beg him to stay and Paul has to leave. And he has to leave because he's been collecting an offering for suffering Christians in Jerusalem. Christians who've been suffering through a famine in Jerusalem, he's been collecting an offering in Macedonia and Achaia, and he has to deliver it there. He can't stick around. But he says, I will come back if God allows me to. And as we saw in our Bible reading today, and as you can see up on the map, Paul leaves Priscilla and her husband Aquila in Ephesus. He sails then into Caesarea, delivers the gift to Jerusalem, and he goes back to Antioch. After a very short break, Paul gets back on the road. You can't hold this man down. When I was in the country of Turkey a couple of years, uh, or sorry, a year ago, um, I was vis visiting a bunch of these places that you see up here on the map. And one day, a group of us were in Pisidian Antioch, and we hiked up this big hill. I've shown you this before. It overlooked the what would have been the Galatian countryside and that ancient trade route. You can actually see it there that Paul walked. Exhausted as I was from one mile of hiking up this hill, it was then that our guide Brad Gray took the opportunity to tell us that he estimates Paul walked or sailed something like 8,000 miles in his three missionary journeys plus his trip to Rome, 8,000 miles, 13,000 kilometers. And it was on his third journey now that Paul leaves for Antioch, uh, leaves from Antioch again. It says up there, you can see that he visits the three churches in Galatia again. But this time the Holy Spirit, when he gets to Pisidian Antioch, does not stop him from going westward. And so as you can see on the map, Paul makes a beeline for Ephesus where he promised to come back. And here's what Luke says when he gets there. Chapter 19, verse 8 says, Paul entered the synagogue and boldly spoke there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. 
Now, listen, we've seen this movie before. Everywhere Paul goes, something like this happens. He goes to the synagogue. He gives the same message that he gave in Pisidian Antioch, is my guess. And people respond. Some people become believers in Jesus. But there are always a significant bunch who reject the message and do so vehemently. And Luke continues by saying, so Paul left them, took the disciples with them, and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. You know, when Pastor Wes and I were in the ruins of Ephesus last year, man, they are truly impressive. If, if you've ever had a chance to see the ruins of Ephesus, anybody been there? Anybody put your hand up? Okay. Are they not amazing? Today, the ruins of Ephesus are a UNESCO World Heritage Site where two million travelers go to see every year. And back in Paul's day, this was a tourist trap as well, but for a different reason. Back in the 50s AD, Ephesus was a place which was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire, built on three hills where the Caister River empties into the Aegean. It was an absolute hotbed of occultic practices and sexual immorality. Ephesus is where the ancient Romans would come from all over the world on religious pilgrimage. There were ancient writings that were actually called the Ephesian letters, little scrolls with words, nonsensical words that you could hardly even pronounce, didn't mean anything. But the people believed that they carried these scrolls around, and when they repeated these words, they had magic, spiritual, occult, occultic power. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world was just outside of the city of Ephesus. It was the temple of Artemis, four times the size of the Parthenon in Athens. And the Ephesians were absolutely rabid about their devotion to their goddess Artemis. Thousands of people every year came to Ephesus to worship her. Thousands came to attend the dramas and comedies and the gladiator games at the great theater there that held 25,000 people. Thousands would come to Ephesus to visit the Agora, that is the marketplace. You put two football fields together is how big this place is. Silversmiths would come to the Agora and make little statuettes of Artemis so that people could take her home with them and could create a little shrine of worship in their living room. And so with so many tourists, it's not surprising that you have many, many thousands who would visit the many, many brothels where men and women and sadly even children were exploited for sexual purposes. And here's a picture of a brothel, um, ancient ruins of a brothel. Nearby the theater and the market and the brothel there in Ephesus, we saw the Library of Celsus. This was built in the early 2nd century BC. I took a picture of the remains that are incredibly intact, as you can see. And this was a building that was built shortly after Paul came to Ephesus. But what really interested me was the little building beside it, to the left of it, with ancient remains, older remains. Some scholars suggest that this, in fact, was the lecture hall of Tyrannus. I can't promise you that's the case, but that's the debate. Here's a close-up picture of what people thought the hall of Tyrannus looked, uh, well, uh, where it was. This is what it looks like today. And, um, and this is where, potentially, Paul taught for two years after he was kicked out of the synagogue. And Paul, by the way, lectured between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. when many people would have been enjoying siesta. And so his lectures must not have been sleepy because people would forego their nap in order to come and hear Paul teach. And Luke says that in a span of about two years, the good news about Jesus became so commonly known in the province of Asia because of Paul's influential teaching in this influential city. Now, later on, at the end of his third missionary journey, Paul will circle around back into the area of Ephesus. He sails into Miletus, which is just south of Ephesus, and the elders of the church at Ephesus will come there to meet with Paul. Paul reminds them what he taught them back when he was teaching at the hall of Tyrannus. And listen carefully to what Paul says. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. 
I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So check this out. Paul goes to this hotbed of occultic activity and sexual immorality where thousands of people are coming from all over the Roman Empire to to gain dark spiritual power, to worship false gods, to engage in sexual sin. And Paul is pleading with Christians to to do two things. Pleading with the people of Ephesus to do two things to respond to the truth of God, that Jesus is Lord, first of all, You must repent of your sin, Paul says. You must believe that you have sinned against a holy God, that he knows that which is right and wrong. That's what repent means, is to turn away from sin and to turn toward God. And the second thing that they must do is to place their faith in Jesus alone as their Lord and life leader, that they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, that they would believe in their heart of hearts that God raised him from the dead. Now, Paul takes this opportunity to remind the Ephesian elders to continue this work of holding to the truth that he began in Ephesus. He says, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. And you can see just how vulnerable the Ephesian church is right now. How vulnerable they will be once Paul leaves. Paul wants to emphasize the desperate need for the church in Ephesus to hold on to, to defend the truth of Scripture, the truth of Jesus. He continues, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you Ephesians and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard, church. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. Sadly, friends, that prophetic word came true shortly after Paul left. When we read Paul's letters to Timothy, who he left in charge as the pastor of the Ephesus church. Paul is writing from Rome in prison. He writes two letters to Timothy. And what they're dealing with is one heresy after another. False teaching has entered the church and has destroyed it. Paul's ministry was so powerful. It was so amazing when he was there. But sadly, the Ephesian church thought they were safe when he left. They took their foot off the gas pedal, so to speak, put the car into cruise control, so to speak, and relaxed. And there were false teachers that seeped into the church with their false teaching. And it significantly limited the impact of this church for years to come. They eventually got a handle on it. And Jesus sent them a bevy of all-star teachers. They finally fixed the problem, but it took a long time. Now, look, we've spent a lot of time so far in our message just sort of exploring the backdrop of the ancient world right now. What I want to do is kind of pull back a bit, and I want to apply what we're seeing here in the text to our lives today. Because if you like it or not, our societies become very, very much like the Ephesian context, hasn't it? And it's becoming more so every day. And I'm not here to poo-poo about the world, because what's really sad and what's the concern, because I'm talking to Christians is that even professed Christ followers today are going in the wrong direction, letting go of the truth of Scripture. Some of them are seeing fortune tellers, uh, consulting their horoscope, going to psychics, making decisions about who to date on the basis of their astrological sign. Friends, the Bible says to flee this stuff. Stay far away. It's not harmless. A few years ago, I went to a local hospital to to visit a young woman who was suicidal and had been admitted to the psych ward there. Her mother, who had never heard or been in Gateway, rather, looked online, found my name, found our number, called me up, would you pray for my daughter? I got there. I spoke to the mother first, and I asked the usual questions. When did she start feeling suicidal? What's going on with your daughter? Why did you send for me to pray for her? And the mother told me, and these are her words, that the problem for her daughter began when the whole family went to visit a psychic. 
a local psychic here in Caledonia. The mother wasn't a Christian from what I could tell, but she, even though she didn't go to church, even though she didn't yet believe in Jesus, she knew that there was a power for deliverance and freedom that could only be found in the name of Jesus. And so I led her and her daughter to faith in Christ, and I warned them about the occult. And I warn you too today, church, danger, Will Robinson, danger. I can't stress this enough. Stay away from all that stuff. But if you have dabbled in it, don't be afraid. Jesus is greater. His blood is sufficient to free you. And it's something that we can help you with. We have a deliverance ministry at Gateway, and we have a set-free retreat that we run in January designed to address these challenges. In addition to and, and connected to the occultic sin that the Ephesians were swimming in there was the sexual sin among them that was just so prevalent in that society. I showed you a picture, didn't I, of one of the brothels, many brothels in the city. The temple of Artemis was filled with male and female and child prostitutes. An important part of worship to the goddess of Artemis was to engage in cultic sex. And it was no wonder then that every Ephesian man in the first century was a religious fanatic. In addition to paid sex and religious sex was the parties when men engaged in consensual sex with other men and other women. Women, consensual sex with other women and other men. It was just a part of the social landscape as it is in our landscape today. And consent is not, in God's eyes, the only thing that's necessary. I'm not unsurprisingly, all of the sexual activity all of the cultic activity that we see in our world today was alive and well in the city of Ephesus. Solomon put it this way, there's nothing new under the sun, right? And what's happening, what's surprising? What's surprising is not that what's going on outside of the church. What's surprising, what's concerning for me, because I don't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. What's surprising for me, friends, and what's so devastating is when acceptance of sin and ignorance of truth seeps into the church. All over Canada now, we're finding more and more churches and pastors are ignoring the truth that God has given us in his scripture. Some of the truth that doesn't play well in our society today is being relaxed. The standards that we find in God's word, the definitions of what God says our sin is being played with. And many Bible teachers today are not able to say, like the apostle Paul, I have taught to you the entire counsel of the scriptures. The temptation is extremely strong, friends to explain away with creative interpretations and mental gymnastics that which God has just so clearly laid out about our sexuality, about our gender, about the occult, about false religions. God has asked us to repent of sin as his followers and to not make excuses as we turn away from sin, as we turn toward Jesus. Friends, there's something that we learn from the story of Paul in Ephesus and it goes like this. There's an important role for every single Christian to guard the truth that God has given us. Because the church is always vulnerable to false teaching. Years after this, Paul will write to Timothy, a pastor, as I said, in Ephesus, and he will tell him the Spirit says clearly that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. Tell us what you really think, Paul. False teaching, he says, are things taught by demons. Sadly, these days that Paul predicted for Ephesus are upon us today. For example, a couple of Sundays ago, some of you will know who I'm talking about. A very well-known Christian speaker and author and pastor gave a message. Much of the message was beautiful as he talked a little bit about loving people who have same-sex attraction. But he implied at the end of the message that it's not sustainable for some Christians to obey the loving boundaries that God has placed around our sexuality. He didn't put it quite that way, but ultimately that's what he implied. 
And Pastor Sam Albury, who I've shared with you before, a guy I really respect, Sam Albury is the same sex attracted pastor, but someone who's committed to obeying the scriptures, which for him then mean living out a life of celibacy and singleness. Sam Albury wrote a devastating critique to this sermon in an article for Christianity Today. And here's what he said. When any leader suggests to me that chaste obedience to Christ in singleness is not sustainable, he is saying the very same thing to me that the devil says. Later in Paul's letter to Timothy, Paul concludes that the role of the pastor is to hold fast to the truth, even if, especially if, it's not popular. And he writes, if you, Timothy, point out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. And he didn't mention this, but he could have. Don't forget, Timothy, that you who teach will be judged more strictly. I tell you, if that doesn't weaken your knees. What we see in these verses is that both leaders and lay leaders or people in a local church must play their role in defending the truth of the gospel. I'm begging you, Gateway, to join me in upholding the truth of Jesus Christ. First of all, pastors, missionaries, elders, leaders in a local church must stay laser focused on the truth of scripture, the good news that Jesus saves sinners. We must hold up the scripture above our society's opinions to have unshakable confidence to believe that God's word is truth. In addition to the leaders of a local church, all Christians are responsible to love sinners, to love those who are engaged in sin enough because they have developed a love for and an appetite for and a desire for and a hunger for God's word. To be in God's word, to have the confidence to know that God's word never has failed, never will fail. Friends, the battle against false teaching is never over. In Miletus, Paul tells them that false teachers will come and they will be like ravenous wolves. Christians who follow them, he says, will be sheep who are easily destroyed. We all play such an important part in defending the holy scriptures and the truth of Jesus. Friends, with the time we have remaining, I want to just take you back to Acts chapter 19. Paul is in Ephesus. He's teaching at the hall of Tyrannus for two years. And let's ask the question quickly, what happens when Jesus' followers stay focused on his truth? And the answer is eternal impact happens. There's an eternal impact because there's a miraculous impact. After telling us that Paul lectured there in the hall for two years, it says that Luke writes, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. Their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left. So many people, I have heard them say that, you know, miracles ceased over the course of the New Testament and eventually dropped off altogether. That's not true. Paul's on his last missionary journey here, and the miracles are increasing. This is the only place that Paul's miracles are described as extraordinary miracles. So I find it very hard to substantiate the theory that miracles waned over time. We see through the book of Acts, God validates the message of his grace through miraculous answers to prayer. There's an impact. There's also a deliverance impact. Luke writes, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. He continues, seven sons of Sceva were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now, it's a weird story, but what it does is highlight that the deliverance ministry of the church in Ephesus was so powerful, it was changing so many lives that word got out that the name of Jesus sets people free. And so people who didn't know better, non-Christian exorcists decided to try it out. But the problem is, if you don't know Jesus, not a good idea to pretend you know him because the demons can tell the difference between Christians and non-Christians. And the point here is that Paul's focus on teaching and living the truth in Ephesus has resulted 
in such a powerful deliverance ministry, so powerful that some people are trying to fake it and imitate it without success. Luke records, when this became known to those living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear in the name of Jesus, held in high honor. So a miraculous impact, a deliverance impact. Thirdly, there was a holiness impact. Holiness be, meaning that people are becoming more like Jesus. And that process of holiness comes as we repent of sin. It says that many of those who believed now came and openly confessed that which they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. Now, I, remember, I reminded you earlier, didn't I, that there were these little scrolls that they had in Ephesus called the Ephesian letters with gibberish written on them. And people would roll them up and put them around and, and believe that by speaking them that they had some kind of supernatural power. Well, all of these little scrolls were brought into one place. And instead of selling them and get, getting their money back, the Christians in Ephesus burned them so that nobody would get their hands on them. And Luke writes, when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. I estimate something in the neighborhood of our money today to be around $8 million burned in this one fire. And so we find that another result of holding to the truth is that Christians are so transformed that they repent of their sin and they're willing to be accountable to living out their faith. And finally, as Paul is getting ready to leave Ephesus, after teaching there for two and a half years, we find that there's a tremendous evangelistic impact. Friends, evangelism is just a fancy way of talking about sharing our faith with our friends so that they might come to know Jesus. Listen to Luke as he tells the story in Acts chapter 19, verses 23 to 28. I'll read it for you. It says, about that time there arose a great, great disturbance. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with workers in related trade and said, you know, my friends, we receive a good income from this business. And now you see how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and practically the whole province of Asia. Demetrius continues, Paul says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There's a danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, but the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia, will be robbed of her divine majesty. And when all the silversmiths heard this, they were furious and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And it says that they shouted this for two hours straight, causing such a commotion that the city clerk had to come down and correct them all. When I was in Turkey a year ago, it was so amazing. I sat in the actual theater where all of this un unraveled. Wes and I were sitting there in this great theater, the exact place where these events transpired 2,000 years ago. Hi, Wes. To my right was the Agora, the very same marketplace where the commotion began, where the silversmiths got worked up because people didn't want their little statuettes of Artemis anymore because so many people were, were becoming Christians. To my left was the possible lecture hall of Tyrannus where Paul taught for two years. I sat there in that very place where all of this evangelistic impact came to a head. It was having an economic impact on the purveyors of evil. And I say, let it be done again. Friends, that's the kind of move of the Spirit that I long for. I want to be a part of this in my lifetime, to see a move of the Spirit that is so powerful that it causes certain businesses to go out of business and make the people running them tremendously angry because people aren't sinning as much as they used to. I want to be part of a mighty move of God where Caledonia and Holman County and the Hamilton area are the hardest place on earth to get to hell from but it requires that we all stand firm on the truth of the word of Jesus, not compromising one single bit the message of God's, mess of God's truth, of God's grace. That we would become more like Paul, who was willing to go to the ends of the world to share the truth that God gave him in his word. I woke up this morning and... Uh, I woke up this morning and I checked my Facebook and somebody had asked on What's Up Caledonia, are there any good psychics to go and visit here in town? And I expected to go on there and to see a list of nothing. And there was no less than seven psychics listed and recommended. 
I want to be part of a move of God where those people go out of business. Let's pray to that end. Would you please stand? Heavenly Father, would you give us your courage to stand firm? Jesus, you have said that when we stand firm and when we obey your commands, our house will be built on a rock. And when the winds blow and the waves crash, our house will stand firm. And my prayer, Lord, is that we will stay focused on your eternal word, that we would get to know the Lord who is revealed therein. And I pray that you would help us to be true to your revealed will in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship God.